Hello. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back at SAGE, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about something that is very near and dear and I'm very passionate about, Cure Duchenne. Uh, Cure Duchenne has been acknowledged over the last couple of years for creating a unique uh, nonprofit business model. The reality is I'd, I'd like to say that we set out to do this purposely, but basically we just applied logic and common sense to a problem. So a little bit of background. Um, I was raised in just a normal household. I had an older brother and sister. My mom used to always call me the pragmatist in the family. And I, because it was my mom telling me that, I never bothered looking up the word to figure out what it meant um, until many years later. And I guess um, she, would, she would tell me that I was always able to shift from um, plan A to plan B pretty quickly without a lot of stress or anxiety. And so I was also very rebellious when I was young. Um, I was, um, especially in my teenage years, I was pretty much a, um, a rebel looking for a cause. And I would go through very intense stages of whether it was horses or rock and roll or travel or whatever it was, I was completely focused on what I was doing. To the point that when I was in college, um, my friends started calling me, saying that I had um, monomania. And um, I did look this word up. And I wasn't real pleased with the first definition about mental illness. Um, so I like to think that um, I tended more towards number two, which was excessive concentration on a single subject. And um, so we, we basically ended up having a huge, huge problem. Our son, Hawken, was born um, in 1997. When he was five years old, he was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We had never heard of this word before, and we really didn't know what to do. And there was a problem in my life that I honestly did not have a solution for, and it was huge. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common form of muscul muscular dystrophy. It affects boys. It's an X-linked chromosome disease. They're usually diagnosed between three and five years old. Usually by the time they're 12 years old, they stop walking, confined to a wheelchair. Later in teen years, they need um, ventilation to breathe. They're unable to move their arms or even use a keyboard on a computer. This was a terrible prognosis. We, we searched. We went to all the doctors. We were basically told, we're told that there's nothing you can do. Go home and love your child. This disease affects all parts of the body. It affects the brain. There's a lack of dystrophin, which is a protein that's in muscles and also in your brain. So there's cognitive issues many times with these kids. Your heart is a muscle, and basically the primary cause of death is cardiac failure, usually with, with boys, young men, in their early to late 20s. So it was a very serious problem. Uh, we were basically told that our son, we were going to lose him, as most, most parents were seeing their, their sons graduate from high school. So Dan Pelota, who actually was a a, a TED talk um, several years ago that I heard and really inspired me. Um, I had already been running a nonprofit for a few years and trying to grapple with just the regulation of the way things were done. There were a couple muscular dystrophy organizations and um, Duchenne organizations, and we tried to work with them, and we really had no intention of going out and starting our own organization. But um, what we heard was, when we'd come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things, that's not the way we do things here. And so we looked at this and thought, well, they don't have a cure yet for a disease, and they're really not very far along, so maybe we shouldn't be doing it their way. And so that was why we created the business model and started moving forward. So Dan uh, Pelota was very articulate in talking about um, the dysfunction of how charities are run and how what the public expects from a charity. It seems that charities are supposed to operate um, with very little money and get big results. And um, he felt and said basically that it's, it's unrealistic to expect um, that, that frugality is, is a measure of success and morality, when in essence we should be thinking big, we should be thinking about problem solving and have setting and, and being rewarded for our accomplishments and for setting high goals and achieving them and not worrying about our expense ratio. 
It's like any business, if you have to operate on an 85% profit margin, you're going to have a tough time. And that's what nonprofits are expected to do. So he basically said, let's change the way we think about changing the world. So here to Shen, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that both my husband and I came out of business. And um, we started looking at traditional nonprofits. And basically what you had is we would, you know, a nonprofit goes out and, and works really, really hard to raise money from people like you to, to donate. Um, and in medical research, what this means is you give a donation in the form of a grant to an academic institution. And the scientists there, you work on a sponsored research program and, um, and you know, if, the, if the, the science is successful and it's promising, a biotech or pharmaceutical company may come in and license that technology. And if that drug is developed and it's commercially successful, then the biotech and the pharmaceutical company make a lot of money. And you, the nonprofit, go back to your donors and ask for more money to do it all over again. It's very, very hard raising money. So what Curtis Shin did is we created what's called the venture philanthropy model. And actually, we didn't, we didn't create it. It was, it was kind of an unknown phrase um, when we started this organization. But a few organizations had already had successful business models, namely, actually one, cystic fibrosis had done a fantastic job with this. So basically, here to Shen, we take our donations. And we work with biotech and pharmaceutical companies as much as we can. The difference between these two models and what, what defines success is for an academic institution, success means getting a paper published. Success for a pharmaceutical or biotech company means having a drug that's working. So Cure Duchenne knows that drug companies make drugs, and so why not partner with them? So we started partnering early with, with drug companies where we would actually invest. And, um, and if there was commercial success, then part of that return would come back to Cure Duchenne, that we could go and reinvest in further research. And so we still have to go back to donors because, as you'll see in just a minute, you know, we, we redeploy the funds, and if we're going to move on to, to more projects, um, we, we do need to continue to raise money. But it's not a one-way street. This is a, a case study um, that actually... Um, it's a very successful case study. In 2004, Cure de Chien, and over the, a couple of years, invested um, $2 million into a little tiny biotech company called Procenza in the Netherlands. And uh, we went through ups and downs with, with their drug development program. And finally, in 2015, a larger biotech company in Northern California bought them called Biomarin. And um, when that transaction happened, our $2 million, we were able to get back about $7 million from that, which we then redeployed into five additional research projects, four of them being biotech companies, one of them being an academic institution. Bamboo Therapeutics is a gene therapy company that potentially has a cure by correcting uh, the DNA. And we invested um, money into that in 2000, um, January 2016, August 2016, Pfizer bought them. In the future, um, if that is successful, and hopefully it will be, you know, at some point, Curtishin will be able to take those funds that we get from that and reinvest it. Capricorn Therapeutics um, has a heart um, stem cell exosomes that's delivered directly to the cardiac. And it is um, in a phase one, too. Again, we're awaiting results for that. Myotherix, Razorex, small companies that Curtishin was the initial funder. Um, Razorex was right out of USC that we created a startup company and licensed the technology. So um, it's, it's really exciting to see that one, one investment that started with people like you in the room here by trusting in an organization that cares so much about a disease, and we have the, the best experts in the world, you can see how it's, the, the funds that donors give us are leveraged and able to grow. So this is, this is a business model that we like to, to um, work with. 
we basically find the best science there is. And another thing that sets Curedition apart from the traditional nonprofits, um, most traditional nonprofits that fund medical research have, you know, very, um, very expert board of um, um, advisors with the scientists. And they, once a year, get together and they do a call for proposals and they meet and they score. And it's, you know, it's, it's a very high-level meeting and they find the best science. Well, that's great. But what if, what if there's certain parts of this disease that aren't being addressed by the proposals that they happen to get? And so we take a top-down view where we basically look at this disease and we realize that it's cardiac, it's diaphragm muscles failure, it's brittle bones, um, it's inflammation and fibrosis and you know, gene replacement and correcting the gene and all these different things that have to be taken care of. So we look at it like from the top down, like we have to impose our will on the science. And so we basically go out and set the targets that we want to address. And we find the best people to work on that. And if nobody's doing it, we create that. And it's, it's worked out to be very successful. Something else that... Um, distinguishes Cure to Shin from, I think, at least at the nonprofits that, that I'm familiar with in, in the muscular dystrophy space, is when it came time to hire our team, um, I did not go to academic institutions. If drug companies make drugs, then I wanted to hire a professional from the pharmaceutical business, which we did. Um, with 30, we hired a scientist with 30 years um, biotech and, and pharmaceutical um, experience who can actually help us through the drug development process. We hired somebody out of a venture capital firm who's in a Stanford, trade, Stanford trained MD that can help us design these deals and, and really work with the biotech companies. And so we find the projects, we find the best projects, we fund them, and we also foster them by um, offering our expertise, um, the patient access, um, the, the key opinion leaders, and we're able to foster these all the way through to the, hopefully, commercialization. So venture philanthropy, I, I believe, in my opinion, is the way that nonprofits should be run, if possible. Um, they're self-sustaining. Again, raising money is really, really hard. And we'll never stop raising money through our galas and our fundraising, and that's really the core. But we are able to tell our donors that we're going to leverage the money that you give us and grow it by being smart with that money. It's replicable. I'm on several panels talking to other nonprofit organizations, especially in the rare disease space, trying to help them understand you know, different financing models, whether it's equity, convertible notes, um, royalties, licensing agreements. There's a lot to learn, and it's taken, us a, it's taken me personally a long time to learn this. And, and I think this is a model that is starting to be replicated a lot in nonprofits. Um, it's, it's a way to rep revolutionize um, the, the medical research. And for me, the most important part is this is a way to get meaningful funds. And I'm not talking, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollar grants. We're talking million or two million dollars where we can actually seed a project and make it happen quickly. So meaningful funds that come back to the people that care the most about what they're gonna do with the money. So we care more than anybody. We care more than the pharmaceutical or the biotech companies about the success of that, that particular drug. And so when we have control over it and we have the say, it goes a lot faster. And again, back to Dan Pelota's point, it's like, let's, let's reward success. And what is success in medical research? It's drugs that help patients, not papers that are published in, in journals. And so... The whole venture philanthropy rewards success by actual results. Speaking of results, um, last year we actually had the first drug approval for Duchenne. It was a long and rocky road getting there. We learned a lot on the way. Um, lots of mistakes and lots of ways that we would do things differently in the future. But we do have one drug approval, so we know we can do this. This drug is not a cure. Um, we still have a long way to go. It doesn't treat the primary cause of death, which is cardiac failure. 
and it only treats about 13% of the patients. But it's a start. And my husband always uses the Roger Bannister um, the four minute mile that until Roger Bannister ran the four minute mile, nobody believed they could do it. And after he did that, lots of people made that record. And so we believe that we are so close to being on the cusp of being able to treat many more boys in a much more meaningful way. So these are a few tiles of, of our investments, and it shows basically um, you know, a top-down view of treating the whole disease, whether it's replacing the dystrophin that's missing, um, treating the, the cardiac failure. Um, we funded an initiative to help companies better understand clinical trials, to accelerate the process because the FDA was being very, very difficult. And so we had to learn how to work with the FDA to give them the information that they needed in a, in a way that they would sign off on it, basically. Um, I'll come back to Exonix and these other, these other ones I mentioned. So just recently, this week in fact, um, on Monday, we just announced um, the formation of a new company called Exonix. And I don't know if any of you have heard of um, gene editing or CRISPR-Cas9, but it's taking the scientific world by storm. It's a means of um, going in and almost like using scissors to edit the gene and put it back together the way you want it to be. And there is so much hope for this technology to cure so many diseases and make it not just a, a chronic issue where you have to have ongoing treatments, but actually a cure. And this is where we're moving towards. So talk about problem solving. Great opportunity. The problem is, is that there are three companies, three public companies that are working on CRISPR-Cas9 technology. They're public companies, which means they're, they're responsibilities to the shareholders. And so they're going to be working on the low-hanging fruit first, which means they're going to be working on diseases where there's like a single organ. So right now they're working on, for example, eye issues. Um, when you look at muscle, we have a lot of muscle in our body, and it's spread all over the place. So just looking at the expense of treating an eyeball versus the muscle throughout your body with a very, very, very expensive delivery system and drug is, is overwhelming. Not to mention, how do you get it throughout the body? It's one thing to inject a needle into a specific organ and cure it. It's another thing to get it throughout your body. So great technology, big problem. They don't want to work on Duchenne right now. And what it's like to be a parent and to see a technology that could cure your kid and nobody wants to touch it because it doesn't fit the business model at this particular point. So what do you do? You find a solution. And our solution was to form a company called Exonix. We licensed the technology from UT Southwestern. Dr. Eric Olson is a premier muscle biologist in, um, in CRISPR technology. And we just had our announcement this week, and we are very, very excited. This is another project that I'm extremely excited about. So um, a company that had a drug that failed to get approval from the FDA, and yet it was shown to be effective in kids. And so here you've got a dichotomy between what the FDA is seeing on paper and what the parents and the children are seeing in their lives, where they're responding everywhere from stabilization of the, of the disease, which is a good thing. Stabilization is really good in Duchenne as well as some of the, the kids actually regaining function and having a better lifestyle and riding bikes where they never were be able to do that before and just improve quality of life. And then the drug is pulled from them because the FDA could not see what the parents saw. So this happened um, about nine months ago. And the parents have been devastated. And um, I'm very close with many of those. And so we... We worked really hard. And again, here's a big problem. A drug that works can't get it to the kid. So to make a very, very long story short, we created another nonprofit called CD Access. And we've negotiated with the company to transfer drug to this nonprofit. And we are now in the drug distribution and delivery business. Um, there's always a way. And there's always a plan B. 
And um, I encourage all nonprofits to think outside the box and figure it's not about running an organization. It's about finding a cure. So this is Hawken. He was number 88 on the Sage football team. Um, he was, um, talk about finding a solution. He loved, he loved football, always. And when he was diagnosed with Duchenne, it was just devastating. He always had a ball in his hand all the time when he was young. And so um, thanks to the coaches here at, at Sage Hill and my husband being persistent, Hawken was able to be part of the football team. And it's been just a tremendous, tremendous story. And Sage has been such a part of our life. And it's extremely satisfying to be here. Um, he's now at USC um, in journalism and writing up a storm. So I would just like to say thank you. And I would like to, if possible, inspire people here, um, especially the kids, that if you have some quirks that people comment on, go with it. Um, embrace it. Um, you know, it's God gives us gifts, and sometimes they're not easy ones, and sometimes they make you feel uncomfortable, and, and you don't fit in really well. But there's a reason why you have a gift. And my, my advice to you is let it, let it play itself out and find a way that you can use that to help other people. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.